Mr. Short, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm just doing the usual sound check. Um, is Mr. McNeely going to be doing the meeting tonight or are you in charge? Uh, yes, he's he's here. He should be here soon. Okay, okay. I just was going through the uh, I was going through the participant list and I didn't see him yet. So. Okay. Yeah, he should be showing up soon. Okay. Okay. All right. We're gonna start in just a minute. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Short, I'm show oh, I'm showing it's four o'clock. Um do you see Mr. McNeely? Yes, he oh, just came there, in. He there came. he is. Okay. Right um, Mr. Mr. McNeely, this is Chair Aunt Tavares. It is four o'clock, so uh please start our study session. I just need to unmute. Yeah, we, there you go. Thanks, okay, Bob. we can hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, th uh, thank you, Chair Ontiveros, and um, welcome Planning and Zoning Commissioners and staff, and thanks for attending um, the first study session of 2023. And as you know, this will be a quick turnaround from this meeting, which really uh, serves as the December 2022 meeting. And um, uh, within a couple of weeks here, a few weeks, we will now then have the January 25th um, PNZ study session and public hearing as well. So if you have your planning and zoning commission study session agenda for today, uh, Madam Chair, we can start going through that. Um, item one on here, well, we start with the items that are scheduled for public hearing on January 25th, 2023. Item one is zone change 2202 combined with subdivision SUB 2203 and DRO 2203. That's a, uh, a request for change of zoning regulations for expansion of the Shadow Mountain Village master development plan that is a multifamily townhouse development that is um, that a previous phase is well underway. Um, Bob is managing this case and already has his screen shared. So Bob, go ahead and uh, give the study session presentation to the commissioners. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jess. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, this is a this is a request for an expansion of the Shadow Mountain Master Development Plan to add a phase two with 84 lots, and this also includes a change of zoning regulations. Uh, and as you know, this is in the PC zone, Plan Community Zone, or some of you will know that. Uh, and it is to allow for modified RM 20A standards for the residential development, and that is to allow for row houses or um, also known as town townhomes. And this is exactly like Shadow Mountain Village phase one. So it's ex almost exactly the same modified standards. It also uh, uh, is a request to allow for a little bit of modification of the CH 10,000 standards for a commercial development that I'll pull up in a minute. And that is basically just to allow for reduction in landscaping, as the commission knows, I think at this point, if you do a self-storage units uh, in Belmont or anywhere else, our landscaping requirements are a little bit too high. The landscaping really doesn't fit on the property well. So that's basically what's that. what that's for, is to reduce landscaping and also possibly to reduce the parking. I'm not clear about the parking yet on that one. 
This also includes the DRO. Since the Belmont area plan was passed, there is a design review for both the multifamily and for commercial developments. Here's some background on this case. Most of you were here at this time when Shadow Mountain Village Phase 1 was approved in 2019 with 94 lots. That has now been final platted and they are building uh, housing uh, on this location. Uh, in that master development plan for Shadow Mountain Village, they did include a designation on the master development plan for some future commercial uses. And at that point, there wasn't a clear plan for moving forward to develop those uses. They were just simply designated on that master development plan. So with this development, when they came back, uh, we indicated at this point uh, to be um, considered as mixed use, which is required here in Belmont uh, by their future by the future land use map. Uh, they do need to actually develop the commercial uses at this time. So this is a vicinity map showing Belmont. And this is this, these are the subject properties. It shows the two new properties for phase two and the commercial properties. I included phase one in here, but phase one's really not part of this zone change. It's uh, completed as is. And this is an aerial photo. You can see the existing with the lots already delineated. And the, the developer is actually able to buy, purchase these two lots. One of them was already approved for uh, uh, some, I believe some storage units, boat and RV storages that did not go through. So they went ahead and purchased this and they want to expand into the same type of development as they had for phase one. And they are they also have plans to phase to uh, develop these properties over here. Uh, known as Shadow Mountain and Hughes Retail Plaza. And this is a kind of a rendition of a master development plan. They'll be providing a, a better copy of this. You, know, you see phase one, phase two, and then the commercial with the retail. And there's actually a coffee shop they plan on putting in. And then here uh, is the self-storage. This is the preliminary plat for Shadow Mountain Phase 2. It's actually kind of turned on its side. So uh, this is the to the right is north and to the left is south. Uh, phase 1 is, is up in this particular case. They also, I'll just point out, uh, the Belmont area plan requires or it shows a trail that would go um, basically around this way. You might remember on Shadow Mountain Wells subdivision done by the same developer that we that we looked at a trail easement be required on that. So they're also doing that with this. It would wrap around this side of it. Um, in some ways, it doesn't really change anything. The development will be the same. Just for continuity, staff is okay with them doing the development the same. They have walkways very similar around this side in on in phase one, but there will be a designated uh, trail easement. So it is for public access through what is otherwise a, a private development. Although they've, they've indicated they really aren't closing the development off, you know, where people can't come in there. It's not like a gated community or anything. And if you look at this particular access right here, this, is, this will provide a second access for them onto Shadow Mountain Drive. So they would have an emergency access and a primary access. Uh, before there was an opening over on, uh, on the pilot uh, road that would have been the emergency access. And they'll probably be closing that off and not using that because it is it was very awkward. This is the... Uh, site plan for their retail plaza, which, as I said, would be a coffee roaster, coffee place here, and then some retail outlets here. Uh, basically, if you're 
coming in and you're going to the pilot or anywhere in this direction, you have to come down, you have to go around the roundabout. So everyone that is going to the pilot would have to go around the roundabout and they would just be visible for them. So that'd be, uh, you know, good for this business to be that visible. So you would come around, you would circulate in, they have a drive through for the coffee and then circulate back out and go out that way. And in terms of the design review, this is the design for that retail plaza. And these are a couple of the designs that they have for the housing. And with that, I'll take any questions from the commission. Mr. Short, I am not seeing anyone's hands raised or unmuted. So Mr. McNeely, we can go ahead and bump to the next item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am gonna go ahead and share my screen. The, the next case that you have is CUP 22118. It's conditional use permit for a campground on 40 acres in the G zone generally within the valley area, but not within the valley area plan. Um, it is at the southeast intersection of Woodland Ranches Road, um, a, a um, main uh, road in this, in this general area that has had other campgrounds off of it. And Alta Via Road is, is a north-south intersection. So I'm going to, um, let's see, share my screen and show you the site plan. Is everyone seeing my uh, seeing my screen here? Yep, we can see it good. Okay. Well, the um, the site plan is for fifty tents. Um, the applicant does have a engineer on board and has done all of their preliminary engineering the wastewater um, uh, submittal requirements. Um, I can tell you they've done a neighborhood compatibility plan as required and, um, and addressed uh, impacts uh, to the immediate surrounding neighbors and, um, and the general area. They've done a traffic impact statement and they're showing on their traffic impact statement um, a peak hours between 6 and 7 p.m. when, when in operation um, in their normal season. Uh, let's see, April, um, April, May, and September. That would be at 75% uh, occupancy in their um, in their peak season, and their peak hour trips are 11.6 trips uh, per hour. So um, we feel pretty manageable. Of course, their project will require an ADOT encroachment permit, where they are adding additional traffic off of Woodland Ranches, a private road. Um, easement um, onto ADOT, the ADOT managed Highway 64. Um, of course, the applicants are um, out of Arizona, Kylie and Andrew Chen. Um, they were approved a couple of years ago for one of the first um, campgrounds approved in this general area, one um, further, much further east and north of Woodland Ranches. Um, that the road improvement requirements that they were going to have to make as these are private roads uh, to get the road to the county standard of supporting a 42,000 pound emergency vehicle. They were finding it um, uh, cost prohibitive to make those improvements to the other piece of property they had. So they are finding one that is that is quite a bit closer to Highway 64, which should help them with meeting those requirements in, um, in getting these private roads up to the county standard for those emergency vehicles. Um, when we scroll through their application packet, um, we see that they've, they've met our requirements, including um, in, uh, their fire and emergency services agreement with High Country Fire. So um, being that they've done their citizen participation plan, we are not seeing any issues at this time. Um, we realize we've done quite a few campgrounds at this point in time and, um, and have really come up with some standardized conditions that eventually we would like to formalize a little more 
in, within uh, internal to the zoning ordinance, um, but certainly all of the um, all of the conditions that you've been seeing on all the plant grounds coming in front of you in recent history, we would anticipate um, we would be addressing with this project as well. Things such as wildlife friendly fencing, um, inform the required information on impacts to public lands, um, fire wise planning, all of those things. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions and I can, I can certainly uh, stop sharing my screen. Okay, uh, Commissioner Best, go ahead. Yeah, I wonder how we're doing with thinking about um, charging stations. Um, it's come up at, at least on one campground. Mm -hmm. And you know, the more you think about it, the more you think this is something that is coming at us and it would be nice to get ahead of it in any commercial development. Sure, uh, absolutely. And and as, as you all know, um, you know, the campgrounds by design as a conditional use permit um, under, uh, in, within the zoning ordinance, um, these, uh, the zoning stays G, the zoning is not commercial. And um, the, the concept uh, that is very much written into the zoning ordinance is that these are a low impact um, and light footprint on the landscape that could be picked up their temporary facilities. You know, all of the camp facilities are temporary facilities um, and um, they could be picked up and go away. So um, with that, though, we, we all know that um, the demand for, for charging stations for electric vehicles is common. We have addressed this um, internally without any, without any actual um, ordinance uh, requiring or limiting um, uh, EV charging stations. Um, the ordinance, the zoning ordinance does require uh, X number of parking spaces for, for various uses. So we are, we are seeing this as the, the applicants can um, provide EV charging stations for their, um, for their clients, for the people who'd be parking there anyways. They're not gonna add more parking than the code would require for their, for their commercial conditional use, um, nor are they going to be in any way allowed to um, attract people for the use of charging their car. In other words, you, you, you could only go to this site, um, park in one of their parking spaces and charge at their EV uh, charging station if you were a client at their location. Um, this, this can in no way under the zoning being, uh, being the G zone be a commercial operation where people are going to a filling station. This is not a filling station. Um, this is a campground. And um, and it I, it is the parking is only in support of the campground. Um, however, we would see it as, as common common sense um, uh, to allow the applicant, if they wanted to, um, uh, include some EV charging stations for their clients. Um, I'll let you know that other jurisdictions are as a part of their sustainability planning. Um, uh, or climate ch uh, um, climate change planning are requiring uh, EV EV parking. Um, I don't believe we're at that point, and we all know that the infrastructure in many of these locations is is so limited um, that it might be hard to get to that to that level at some point, particularly at these locations. And we're trying to stay true to the intent of the zoning ordinance on these campgrounds in that they are a light footprint on the ground, low infrastructure. They can literally fold up the tents and go away and the land should be um, pretty much as if nothing had, had been developed there. So does that answer your questions, um, uh, uh, Commissioner? Um, let's see. <laughs> Best. Whatever my name is, yeah. Yes, uh, yes. It, it does and I, I, obviously this is a work in progress and I think you're, you're uh, I'm sure that your planning magazines are talking about this, and oh, heck yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's a it's a topic of discussion in the planning world. Uh, yes. it, it sounds like you just said that uh, they can put one in every parking space, which I think is a good start. They they could. We we would um, we would probably question and work with them on. Hey, this um, every parking space I think would be a bit much, I, and I don't think they they want to go to that kind of infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. Um, providing a couple for the, you know, if we think about the ratio of EVs on the road these days, 
um, uh, you know, providing a couple would definitely make sense that you see that very common at restaurants. You see it extremely common at hotels where you're going to stay over the night. Um, so we could see a few um, that it would start looking a little weird if they were providing um, quite a few. And I think that problem will take care of itself because I don't think the applicants um, really going to want to invest that heavily in that infrastructure. I agree. Yeah, early stages, but it's definitely going in that direction. So I, I think that uh, things will change as time goes on. Absolutely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I see that uh, Commissioner Ruggles has a question. Commissioner Ruggles. Yes, thank you. Uh, I uh, usually listen in on the uh, staff uh, study session before this, and I believe Jessica mentioned something about lighting relative to this uh, uh, CUP. And I think it was about uplighting, which um, is not permissible under the code. I don't know if that uh, if she was referring to the fact that we wound up with something like that proposed with uh, this particular CUP uh, or not. So I just okay. wanted to make sure that uh, I address that. Yes, th thank you very much. And uh, no, they, they do propose some solar pathway lights, solar tent lanterns, and solar uh, sign lights for their signs they're not up lighting and um, they, they can propose things uh, as a part of their CUP they still have to get them permitted and to actually get through the permitting process it will go um, as it's actually you know, going to go to the dark sky specialist um, for a lighting permit so uh, yeah we're, I don't see at this point in time that we that we have an issue um, nor would uh, the CUP allow them to violate our lighting ordinance. They still have to get a lighting permit that conforms to the lighting ordinance. Right, well, I would definitely make sure that it wasn't in the uh, CUP that you could do that, but uh, yes. I just wanted to be, uh, wanted everybody to be clear on that, that's all. So okay. thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, um, Madam Chair or any of the commissioners? Um, Mr. McNeely, let's see, I'm looking to see <clears throat> if any of the, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I just wanted to ask you, um, kind of follow up on Commissioner Bess's uh, question on the EV charging stations in the campgrounds, um, and I and I do appreciate the clarification that it is in the general zone, not the commercial zone. It's a you know, uh, as can be with a conditional use permit. What I'm wondering is um, when the applicant. Uh, puts uh, hypothetically puts in a couple of EV charging stations. Are they supplying? Is this a, is this a perk to the uh, to their their campers, or are they going to be charging for it? Madam Chair, that's a that's a very good question, um, and I I don't see that in this project at this point in time, that this applicant is, um, is proposing uh, EV charging stations. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there's uh, any people who are more familiar with the EV charging, um, typical business models would, would know the answer to that question. Uh, um, and, and I don't know if there's any among us uh, who own an EV and when you pull up to a, if you stay at a hotel with an EV charging station, or if you're eating at a restaurant and use an EV charging station, I, I would be interested to know what, what the, what the com more common business models are um, and how the EV charging stations are supplied and how the infrastructure is paid for. And is it a perk to, um, to the person using it or not. I, that, that I don't know, but I, I think those are things that we'll be learning a lot more about. Okay, um, I may follow up on that, but Commissioner Clifford has raised his hand and I'm wondering if he might have some information. Please go ahead. Um, yes, I do. It is up to the discretion of the uh, owner as to if they are going to charge for it or if it's going to be a perk. Um, where I work, uh, the charging stations are a perk to the associates who drive the EVs. If you go to the motel where um, we have a, a contract and you plug in there, you have to pay for it. Same as you would if you pulled into a fuel station. 
restaurant um, downtown Phoenix by the uh, um, used to be Bank One Ballpark where Suns and uh, uh, the baseball stadium is and all of that. You have to pay for those. Those are on uh, on the city streets. Um, so it's up to the discretion of the owner. Okay, th um, thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Clifford. And uh, let's see, it looks like Kelly Bingham has raised her hand. Please go ahead, Ms. Bingham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm also pretty familiar with charging. Uh, I do own an electric car. And I would say that oftentimes um, they're owned by third parties, particularly if they're a fast charger. If they're owned by third parties, they do charge. Uh, as far as I can tell, typically it would be a slow overnight charger uh, where it would be supplied by the owner. Um, so that's something to think about if they're looking to get funds from the state uh, or other grants and things like that, or if they're looking to partner with a third party, uh, it is often something that they would be charged for. Okay, thank you for that, um, Ms. Bingham. And actually the um, information supplied by Commissioner Clifford and Ms. Bingham is a really good segue to where I was headed because I have done a little bit of research and <clears throat> Ms. Bingham hit the nail on the head where she said a lot of them are third party. And so um, we have the general, the campgrounds go in a general zone. And when you start charging for um, fueling stations, that bumps this to a commercial use. And I'm wondering, I, I can't quite get, I can't quite get this to dovetail on um, because the ordinance, our zoning ordinance lists on EV charging stations as fuel stations. And so, which is something that goes into the commercial zone. But um, if there is somebody who like owns a house, is building a house and they've got an EV vehicle and they want to um, get it wired because they want to plug in their personal one, that's a completely completely separate, that's apples and oranges from a third party coming in, establishing an EV charging station, and then the other people charge for it. So I'm wondering how, how this works with our zoning ordinance. And, and um, I, it just seems like there's, there's some hiccups here to me. Mr. McNeely, can you, can you pick up on that? Well, I think that's a great thing to address with our comprehensive plan update um, and and our and any follow on you know um, zoning ordinance updates driven by driven by that comprehensive plan update. I, I can tell you right now, I was just re-scrolling through through the application materials, and um, this entire campground is going to be run on solar power with a small generator as backup. So I I highly doubt that they will be coming to us later. Um, unless they unless they eventually run APS to this site, um, but I, I highly doubt with a with um, solar and a generator that on this application we will be seeing EV charging stations. Um, again, I, I think it, then it's just making a, a director's determination, which the zoning ordinance um, clearly lays out a process for that um, we can look at we can look at a parking space um, possibly with um, an EV charging station. And determine is that just a parking space, and the EV charging station happens to be there um, out of convenience, uh, much like if we had one at our home, or is this a fueling station where people are coming to refuel? If it's a fueling station, sorry, wrong, wrong use, wrong zone. Um, this, that's not what we're looking at with these campgrounds. Um, if it's an incidental parking space, um, you know, we're we're here to work with people. Uh, we're here to be supportive of emerging technologies. Uh, I think that's, you know, some, it's kind of some of the charge, some of the things I've, I've been hearing from, from many of our supervisors for years, um, that, uh, it, that I wouldn't see any reason to be, to be overly restrictive or prohibitive for no good reason, <laughs> um, and say, no, that thou shalt not have an, an EV charging station at your campground when, when really it's just a parking space, um, for someone who happens to be driving an EV vehicle. So I, I think I think it's going to be a case by case basis until until we get some tighter um, direction 
on it and definitions on it. Um, it hasn't been a problem so far. Uh, many of y'all know I, I worked as I worked in the city of Sedona for a year um, where there's a lot more of this um, was not a problem. Um, uh, uh, the, the community saw it as a win-win um, to always get more EV spaces within a commercial use. Um, so the, the conflation or, or concern over what is, a, what is a fueling station versus what is some, some other commercial use um, really wasn't a problem. Um, you know, it, it came up with that one campground that, that you saw where they were putting in a strange number of parking of EV parking spaces. And, and we re-looked at that and said, mm, no, 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 this, this cannot be a fueling station and you can't be bringing people off the highway to refuel themselves here. This is a campground. Any parking spaces in this campground are incidental to and in support of the campground only. So I think if we start with that principle um, and, and work with, um, within the parameters that the zoning ordinance gives us, for directors interpretations I, I think we can be okay for a while and, and we all know the world changes and if we're if we're um good in the planning arena then um we're we're working uh to get our planning documents and our ordinances um to where they can support a, a changing a changing world for for certain things without negative impacts certainly right and and with that i definitely agree that it is a changing world that we're living in um, did the city of Sedona, when, when they were put in, or when you saw this, did the businesses that put them in or, or were required to put them in, were they incidental, do you know, or did they charge the consumer for it? I know the parking spaces were incidental, and, and in all honesty, we, we didn't make it our business to know if, if they were charging or not on, 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 how, on how that happened. Okay. Okay, I'm just curious, and, and I know, um, I think probably Commissioner Best questions are going back to that campground application where it was suggested or proposed. Um, so I agree, it's a changing world we're living in, case by case basis. And if uh, this campground is going to be solar, it wouldn't even make sense. So we'll, we'll, we'll address it when we get to it. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so let's go ahead and move to item number three. Thank you, Madam Chair. So item number three um, is, your, is your final public hearing item for January 25th public hearing. It is CUP 2184, and Zach is managing it, so already sharing his screen. Go ahead, Zach. Uh, thank you, Mr. McNeely, Madam Chair, and Commissioners. Uh, so this request is for a drug and alcohol rehab center, which our zoning ordinance defines as a hospital or health clinic, or at least that's the use that we find it fitting in. Uh, they, the applicant would use an existing residence on their property that's eight bedrooms and eight bathrooms, 10,500 square feet for the use. Uh, it would have a maximum of 16 guests and seven employees that would rotate, but there would always be somebody there on a 24 seven basis. Uh, the employees would have eight hour shifts in the rotations. <clears throat> Guests would stay for 30 to 90 days for post detox counseling and rehabilitation. And the applicant's narrative included a couple of photos of the property and the bedroom here. Also the applicant and the applicant's representative are on uh, with us tonight if you have any questions for them. But here's a vicinity map. So this is uh, east of Happy Jack area, uh, off of Highway 87, through the Forest Service and through Starlight Pines Ranchettes uh, is the legal access for the subject property here. The applicant also owns this property, this L-shaped property. So this is 90 acres and the subject property is 30 acres. And here is an aerial view. So you can see it's pretty heavily wooded. This is where the legal access comes through to the subject property. And the existing home is here in the north central portion of the 30 acre parcel. These are just some general floor plans. So it's a three story home, uh, four bedrooms on the main floor, or sorry, four bedrooms on the main floor, four bedrooms on the second floor, and the third floor has an observatory. There's also a large garage. 
Uh, for this case, some things I've been looking into already were uh, fire and emergency response and roads and access. So as far as fire and emergency response, this property is actually within the Blue Ridge Fire District. Uh, the, the firehouse is actually about three miles away. The residence also has a 10,000 gallon water tank, fire sprinklers, which you don't see typically in residential structures, smoke detectors, fire extinguishers. Uh, the, the applicant's narrative also notes that there are rope ladders in every second and third story room. Uh, as far as the access, uh, I did send the applicants submitted in their packet sort of a run through of all of the deeded legal access to the property. I did send that to the county surveyor. They've gone through it and they verified that there is legal access to the property through the other subdivisions. Uh, the applicant's submittals include uh, some engineering done by SWI that notes that some of the roads or a portion of the roads to the property would need some improvement in order to meet the 42,000 pound uh, requirement for emergency vehicle access. So the applicant's already working uh, toward that requirement. Uh, also in the submittals, SWI submitted a traffic impact statement that shows that there would be under 100 trips during the peak hour uh, as far as traffic. And I was going to, uh, I'm going to ask the applicant to give me a little bit more of a realistic number of what that means per day uh, and that sort of thing for your analysis. Uh, one topic that I've been looking into is there's a portion of the access that goes through Forest Service and uh, that requires a special use permit from the Forest Service for maintenance and liability. And so I've been looking into whether or not this change of use uh, would need to update the special use permit. And I've gotten some correspondence on that from the Forest Service, uh, but I, they need to look at an updated um, special use permit. I have the one from, I think it's 1996. There's an update to that from 2015, um, where it may or may not require a change of that special use permit. So that's an important item that I should hear back, I think tomorrow from the Forest Service, as to whether or not they'd make that change. Typically, that's something where staff likes to continue the case until that's figured out because that's a pretty big issue. Uh, but the contact said that likely this sort of use won't need to update the special use permit. As far as citizen participation, uh, this is actually a pretty controversial case already. The applicant uh, held a meeting on March 3rd, 2022 via Zoom. Uh, they notified property owners within a thousand feet of the subject property, and that was seven property owners. But I think word got around and 75 plus participants were on the Zoom meeting. Over 30 of them commented. And generally they had concerns about security and safety, increased traffic, community character. Many of them didn't want to see any sort of business in the area. Uh, concerns about property value and concerns about whether or not they could, they had legal access. Um, and again, I've confirmed that they have legal access, but still looking into the special use permit issue. Um, and since that meeting, staff has received 18 emails opposed. They generally are the same concerns that I've listed here on this slide. I wanted to go through um, what the applicant has how the applicant has responded to these concerns. So regarding safety and security, the applicants noted that this isn't a use for criminals. This is for people with a disease um, that guests would be supervised by staff at all times and not permitted to leave the property. Uh, the applicants has noted that they have at least 20 surveillance cameras on the property already. Um, and as would happen with any sort of criminal activity, whether it be just a typical single family residence or this use inside of um, a single family residence, the sheriff can respond to those sort of issues. 
the applicant's response to increased traffic concerns are that they have a 30 acre parcel that they could split into three residences uh, or three parcels at 10 acres, and each of those could have a separate residence, which could result in similar traffic to what you might see from this requested use. Um, and again, I want to get back to, I want to ask the applicant for a little bit more specificity on what it means to have less than 100 peak hour trips so that you can uh, better analyze that for yourselves against the findings. Uh, the applicant also noted that to access the property, you only pass 11 residences on Moki Drive uh, through the Starlight Pines Ranchettes, and I think a portion of the access goes through Moki Ranchettes as well. Uh, and the response to the property value question is that <clears throat> the home is not visible to any neighbor and that there's no evidence to support that there would be a reduction in property value. So I just wanted to lay out what, what was in the citizen participation plan, uh, just because there will be some controversy for this case. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, or concerns, anything that I can research for the staff report. Again, the applicant and the representative are on with us if you have any questions. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bess, go ahead. All right, we're set up for egress in case of fire. We have two ways out. Commissioner Best, it does look on the applicant's site plan like there might be an access through to forest service roads on the south. Whether or not that's technically permissible to use that as a second access, uh, I'm not aware of. It looks like there's a network of different Forest Service roads in the area that possibly could be used, uh, but I'll, I'll definitely make sure to to look into that further for the staff report. I'm gonna write might, that down. might also uh, have a condition that there's uh, enough transportation <clears throat> on site to get everybody off site in an emergency because it you know somebody flicks a cigarette out on the highway to the southwest and it could happen very very quickly as we all know. Right, I'll look into that. One thing I want to note on the having additional ingress egress is that typically there's a higher threshold, I think, than for this use to require that. If you would all like to put that as a condition, I, that makes sense to me, I suppose. But um, I'll make sure in my analysis that we've at least looked at what the applicant is thinking that they have in mind for that. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Commissioner Bast and Mr. Schwartz. I've got a question, and it kind of goes to the traffic, if you will. Um, is this a, a place where the where the um, the people, the ones that are doing drug and, uh, and or alcohol rehabilitation, is this a place where they would? I don't want to use the word confined, but would they be confined? Like if you're coming in for treatment here, would you be required to stay there or are they going to be coming and going uh, during the day? Because a hundred trips per day to me, well, I know it says less than a hundred, but I don't even know how we could even get to that if it was an in-house, maybe that's a better word for it, just an in-house rehab facility where the clients come in and receive the treatment they need and their, their, the supplies, the food, et cetera, are brought in by others. So do you know, Mr. Schwartz, or is that a better question for the applicant? Sure, Antiveros, I'm glad you brought it up because I think that that's the model that you're really not expected to leave uh, until after your 30 to 90 day program ends. So that was my thought as well, that the traffic would be uh, substantially lower than 100 trips per peak hour. Um, but I maybe I skipped over it in the applicant's narrative. I didn't see that level of specificity. So maybe the applicant could address that. Um, yeah, I think that that would be a good idea because that would be, you know, that's really going to let us know as commissioners on, um, you know, what, what's really going on here. So if the applicant could address that, um, I would very much appreciate it.
Uh, Teva Shrike, on behalf of the applicant, can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Go ahead. Thank you. The model is, is that they would stay there. Uh, and so they would uh, be required to stay on site on premises uh, and they would not leave the, the, the property or be wandering in the woods or be wandering in the uh, resident neighborhoods uh, adjacent or otherwise, they would be there. Really the people that would be coming and going to the facility would just be the uh, people working there um, and servicing it. Uh, it would be, you know, we think no more in, in full operational swing. It would be no more than probably seven people at any given time. We will work on and give you more um, better figures, but with seven employees, you know, one of them may be including a chef, a director, maybe a, a, a few repair person, those trips coming and going would, would be the numbers that would be coming and going in traffic. So we will work on giving you better numbers uh, for that. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate that. And would, would this also be uh, something where their family members, you know, I, I don't, I know a little bit about um, drug and alcohol rehab but I don't know a lot. I certainly am not qualified to, to run a facility. But I'm just wondering if maybe also in the mix of things that maybe their family members or those that are supportive of them uh, would be coming. Do you know? There, there, would, be, there would be family members on, on, on scheduled visiting days and things of that nature that would uh, come and go uh, as well. Yes. But oh, the okay. The residents would be expected to stay. This is post, uh, you know, post detox, so they would be ex expected to stay on site the uh, for the number of days of their treatment plan, and they would not be coming and going. Okay, got you. And I and I can only think that um, it's going to be a treatment plan, and so things are going to be very scheduled. So they would not have family members and or friends just coming. Uh, really nilly any time of the day or night that it would be a very structured um, operation. Am I that correct is, with that? That is correct. Gotcha. Okay, that is all of the questions that I've got. Um, thank you for that. And Madam any, Chairman. Uh, uh, yes, um, could you please identify yourself? Are you the My applicant? No, is anybody else that's on those properties in the uh, vicinity of this um, property. Um, able okay, to are you, uh, Ms. Ms. Miller Curtis, are you um, an individual in the public or perhaps a neighbor? An individual in the an public. An individual, okay. Um, I'm not going to be accepting any um, calls, comments, questions from the public. This is simply a study session and it is for the staff for the planning and zoning commissioners, the applicant and the applicant's representative. So respectfully, I'm gonna to have to ask that you please mute at this time. Okay, can um, I ask during, during the hearing, during the public hearing, that would be when you would come, you would state your name and address for the record, and then your comments would be heard at that time. So, so we, will be time, able to, we will be able to speak and I'm sorry, but this is simply a study session and okay, I cannot that's, allow that's you at fine. this time. That's so fine, Madam Chairman. That's fine, Thank Madam you. Chair. I just wanted to make sure that the public will be able to speak about absolutely. this. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, you bet, at the public hearing, absolutely, yes. Thank okay. you. Madam Thank Chair, you. if I could just add to that, um, I'm the planner yes. handling the case and I'll be doing the analysis. Uh, it's likely that I'll be including some comments attached to the staff report and that sort of thing. So please reach out directly to me. Uh, I'll put my phone number and email address in the chat and send your comments to me that will be provided prior to the hearing. You can also speak at the hearing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much um, for that, Mr. Schwartz and Ms. Miller Curtis. Um, please do look at the chat section and get Mr. Schwartz's contact information so that the questions that you are raising, you can contact him directly even before the public hearing. So thank you very much for that. Okay. And that includes it. Okay. I see it right now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Zach. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Thank you. Um, are there any other commissioners that have questions for the applicant or the applicant's representative? 
Okay, and I'm not seeing any. So, Mr. McNeely, if you would like to go to the administrative renewals. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if you'll go to the administrative renewal section of your study session agenda, you'll see we just have one listed here. It's for CUP 22-121, request to renew a conditional use permit for a manufactured home park in the G zone. This would be in Tuba City. Uh, so this would be um, the one significant manufactured home park in Tuba City. Um, staff is not seeing any issues with that administrative renewal at this point in time. Um, are there any questions from the commissioners on that uh, manufactured home park administrative renewal uh, for the conditional use permit? Okay, not seeing any, Mr. McNeely. So let's go ahead and move on to community development department update, please. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. On your department update, item one here. Um, as we let you know every month that the county is still partnering um, with other, other communities in the Route 66 Brownfields EPA grant. Um, as we've let you know, the grant is managed by NACOG. And um, one of the reasons we'd like to leave this on our agenda is to let people know that property owners are being solicited for, uh, for projects, for Brownfield projects. We have Melissa Shaw with us, our long range planner, um, she's, she's our lead staff person with this project. Um, if any, does anyone have any questions of Melissa on the, uh, on the Brownfields EPA grant? Okay. Well, if any come up, then, uh, just please contact Melissa directly. Item number two, uh, reminder that, that our staff is continuing to work with the city of Flagstaff planners on updating the Flagstaff Regional Plan. Of course, the Flagstaff Regional Plan uh, acts as an amendment to our comprehensive plan and functions um, essentially as, a, um, as an area plan for us. Um, it's, it's very effective. Um, some very good analysis goes into it. So we are very happy to partner with the city in updating that plan. Um, that process is continuing. And I believe Melissa wanted to give you a little bit of an update on what's taking place in that process. So, Melissa. Thank you, Jess. Uh, Chairman Tiveros, I um, had a short presentation that if you feel there is time, I would like to, to share that with the commission. Um, just to give you an idea of where the regional plan is in the process, um, because we're moving into the phase of it's called scenario planning. And um, I've got a presentation that was put together by Cascadia Partners, which is the consultant helping uh, to do that scenario planning work. So um, it could probably be about 10 minutes. If you feel like there's time for that, I would be happy to share my screen. Okay, uh, Michelle, let's see. I'm looking at the time that would take us until about five o'clock. And let's see, I think that we can do it. I think it would be useful. So let's go ahead and move and move through this. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll share my screen. Okay, let me get into presentation mode. All right, do you see that? Yep, we see it. All right, great. So just to give a little bit of uh, background, Cascadia Partners, they are out of the Pacific Northwest. And they are a very experienced planning firm who's done, um, they are kind of a, a leader in this type of planning analysis called scenario planning. So I'm not doing them justice in terms of promoting their, um, their credentials, but they are very experienced. And then this next slide just has a, this is the list of the, um, the project consultants. You do see over here, there are two local um, consultants who are helping with community outreach, Eunice So and then Renee Red Day. So um, they will be very involved in the outreach portion of this portion of the regional plan update. And then the rest of the team is based in, um, I be believe it is in the Portland area. And so, with scenario planning, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is obviously um, 
population growth in the region and then within Flagstaff and then in the county as a whole. And there are varying um, analysis in terms of projections. And you can see this chart here goes out to 2050. And these projections come from Department of Economic Opportunity from the state demographer. So these are projections that are considered to be the official numbers that are rolled out by the state. And depending on whether it's a high growth scenario, mid, um, a mid growth scenario or low growth, you can see the population is projected to either grow or actually decline slightly. So this is something that will be wrapped in, this information will be wrapped into the scenario planning process. Another other pieces of information, and there will be a lot of them, um, include what, and this is not a term I had actually been introduced to before, but the VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, as far as things like emerging trends, emerging technology that we talked about a little bit earlier with EV charging stations, but also, you know, multiple new issues that we haven't thought about in the past. So the scenario planning will do some initial workshops to get a sense of what the community sees these, these VUCA issues are and then learn how to wrap them into the actual modeling. So this next slide kind of shows what, what the consultants are calling a traditional planning approach where we think about where we are today, a snapshot of today's uh, situation where we are with um, population, land use, transportation, you can see the whole list here um, of different issues that we would think about. And then we, we make a, a guess about what the future might look like. And so this is a very kind of high level diagram of what they're calling a traditional planning approach. But the scenario planning approach is more organized, if you will. So it actually takes all of these ideas, all of these inputs, if you will, and then plugs them into a computer model that is basic, it's built off of land use, it's built off of our land base, and then comes up with futures that are determined by the community. And those futures then will actually look at different alternatives, you know, um, and put in different, um, I guess, widgets, if you will, to think about, well, if we take one thing out, and if we add one other thing, what does that look like? So. Um, this calls exploratory scenario planning and the um, Lincoln Institute has done a lot of pioneering work in this uh, type of modeling. So it's fairly new to the planning field, but it is getting and gaining a lot of interest countrywide. Um, it does, it is heavy in the data analysis side. So that's why there's a consultant on board um, to actually build and run this model. So you can kind of see uh, this is part of the process. Um, we're over on the left side in this external factor phase where it's going to be reaching out to the community to think about these external factors as they call them. And um, you know, think about what's going to influence the future. What are the unforeseen issues that we can think of that we want to play out, see how they might play out in the future and then think of ways to address them. And then they start to get organized into themes and looking toward the future, you know, how does the community, how does the region want to grow between now and 20 years? And then that's when the modeling starts to take place. So the modeling phase is where they use a computer model and that will actually look at how well each, each scenario will address the community's goals. And then the final uh, phase is to select that future. So to actually look at which of the outputs from the model the community prefers, and that's what's gonna be actually wrapped into the policies and the goals of the regional plan. So this is a more detailed slide, and I won't spend too much time on this because there is a schedule for rolling this out. And you can see it goes out onto 2024. There is a, an anticipated, um, planned adoption date, or at least, um, you know, um, proposed adoption date of 2025 for the regional plan. Um, so you can see uh, we're here now in the first quarter of 2023. And the, um, you know, there's actually going to be public workshops, many public workshops that will reach out into the community to figure out what are the themes going to be. And then once the modeling 
is complete to come back and look at what the output has been. And this is again, um, just a visual on how scenarios are created. And really, I think looking at this column and then this, this, uh, this middle column with these different um, images here kind of show how this works. So going through these initial workshops where we think about different futures and envision different futures and coming up with different strategies for getting to it, that's when the themes are organized. And then those themes lead into the scenarios. So there'll be different scenarios and um, those will be, that's where the choices will need to be made because whatever preferred scenario the community comes up with then will actually drive the land use map and the goals and policies. So these are just different ways of graphically depicting the scenario planning process. Uh, this, so the image on the right, you've probably seen, this is our current uh, regional plan future growth illustration. And so information that will, will be fed into this will include land use scenarios, the regional transportation plan, which that plan has just been updated, um, our zoning code and our zoning information, um, our basic land use details, and then the area plans. So there are multiple area plans within the region. So all of that information will get fed into the modeling. Uh, the consultant is planning to use this um, software called Urban Footprint, and they have a license for it. So that's something that um, has been designed. It's, a, it's a, um, again, a computer model that they can use to actually then generate visual diagrams to show the preferred scenario. And there will obviously be a no action alternative. Um, and they're working on that model right now. We've provided them with information on our existing zoning and they've got details on um, our current land base to start to developing that bottom line. And then I mentioned that there's gonna be um, engagement and public outreach. And you can kind of see this graphic shows the nesting of, um, of the efforts and the initiative of different groups who will be working on the scenario modeling process. So there's a kind of a core project team. Uh, right now, uh, a technical advisory group is being formed that will, will be overviewing the inputs to the model. And then we'll be taking the outputs to our commissions, councils, and boards for um, updates as this process moves along. And then there'll be um, an effort to go out to um, community organizations and ask those partners to help spread the word, if you will. And then obviously our public workshops. So this is where the local um, experts will help us to do the outreach. And then this is the last slide. And um, this is actually an old slide that is already been, um, it's, it's a bit old now because the technical advisory group is pretty much in formation. So that's what I had as far as this, this um, slideshow and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, but this, no, is, this, is, this no. is Caroline Tavares and I just wanna say that that is really something. Um, how, how they do this planning. Pretty incredible. Uh, Commissioner Bass? Yeah, could you please send this out to us? Sure, I will be happy to. Thank you very much. Also, um, Melissa, I don't know if you know this or not. Um, is it, was the conservation land system in the regional plan? I believe it is mentioned in the regional plan. Yes, Commissioner Best. Um, that, that, that I think is a kind of a core strategy. Um, in a few words, a conservation land system looks at all the biological and I suppose landscape assets and tries to figure out how to, what, as things are built out, how to retain them all. So what do the deer need? What do various plants need? Um, what has to be protected to keep 
the biological uh, integrity of the region. And uh, if you want to uh, want to know what it really is, then look up Conservation Land System Pima County because they did it down there. But it's uh, they did uh, they did quite a project down there. And I know Melissa is familiar with it. Spent many many millions of dollars acquiring land to keep their um, plant and animal kingdoms intact. And I think that's a that's a good way to look at the world, in my opinion. So uh, maybe you could bring that up. Okay. I Thanks. will definitely pass that on. Thank you. Okay. Th uh, thank you, Commissioner Baust. Any other questions for Ms. Shaw? All right. I'm not seeing any. So let's bump to number three, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, item number three, uh, we wanted to let you know, um, as, as many of you have, have known, that staff has initiated a um, uh, process to update, do our 10-year update to the county comprehensive plan. Um, the next uh, actual formal um, meeting we have on the comprehensive plan update are what's called scoping workshops. And Melissa could describe the scoping workshops um, a bit better, but we are getting many community partners um, and a lot of interagency and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of county staff involved in these scoping workshops to look at what, the, what, what will be the scope of this next comprehensive plan update. Those um, scoping workshops are planned for January 13th, uh, next Friday and January 26th. And I believe we have two commissioners participating with us. And I believe it's uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Best and Commissioner Clifford who are participating with us. Um, but we will be providing the, the entire commission updates. Uh, we'll be providing you an update of what comes out of these scoping workshops. Um, we will be pro providing you updates on what the public participation plan looks like as it goes to the, um, to the Board of Supervisors for approval. Um, and uh, as, as we outline this process, there will be regular updates and I'm sure regular involvement with the commissioners. Um, so Melissa, if there's anything you wanted to expound on, on item three and uh, commissioners, if there's any questions of staff on the, on the update, uh, we anticipate about a two year plus update to the, uh, to the comprehensive plan. Thanks, Jess, I'll just add a little bit to that. Um... The workshops, it's actually a part one and part two. That's how it's been organized. And what we're asking the participants to do is, is take a look at our existing 2015 comprehensive plan and do an analysis of it, basically a strength, weakness, opportunities, and challenges um, analysis of it. And that then will help us to propose a scope for the update going forward. So that is actually part one is to do the SWSC, the SWAC analysis. And then, and then part two would be to um, help us um, basically propose and create a scoping document going forward. So um, it's each, each workshop day is we plan for two hours each day. And we have a, a pretty wide mix of um, partners who have, have experience with the comprehensive plan is really what we were, we were hoping to get um, that sort of perspective. So people that have used the plan and are familiar with it can really give us come, some good feedback. So we know what to look for going forward. And then we do plan to bring those workshop results to the commission in February at your study session because then we um, will take it on to the, to the board as an information um, item in March. And then we do have um, a plan to also in February, bring to you a draft of the public participation plan, or at least an outline of the public participation plan, because we do need to have the board review that as well before we can really launch the project. So those are kind of the two um, major initiatives going on right now with the comprehensive plan update. Any okay. questions, Madam Chair or commissioners on, on, on the comprehensive plan update? 
Mr. McNeely, I'm not seeing any, so we can continue on. All right. So, Madam Chair, uh, item number four is just to let you know that staff is actively working to update uh, dark sky lighting code, actually the, the section of our zoning ordinance that is the line, lighting code. Um, this, is, this will be based on the city of Flagstaff lighting code that was recently adopted. Um, this is a process that was recommended by the, the JLIS, the Joint Land Use Study with Camp Navajo and the Naval Observatory, um, in which there was, uh, there was some analysis done um, with, uh, with the current status inventory, uh, if you will, of, of what the lighting situation is in the city of Flagstaff and in, uh, in the county. A lot of work um, with various community members went into updating the city of Flagstaff uh, lighting ordinance. Um, we are now working with that to make what tweaks are necessary uh, to have a consistent lighting ordinance. That was another uh, recommendation coming out of the JLIS um, that the two lighting ordinances are very consistent. So we're, we are working with that to, um, to uh, edit and, and create something that, um, that will work with the county process. Um, and as many of you know, we have one dark sky specialist, a position that is shared between the city and the county, yet another recommendation of the JLIS um, that, is, that is now an active, uh, an active program um, that, will use, um, that will use this ordinance for the permitting and actually the dark, side, the dark sky specialist is currently the lead on all, all uh, lighting permitting for both the city and the county, lighting permitting and, and code enforcement within, within the city and the county. As we update the lighting code portion of the zoning ordinance, um, we will also do some non-substantive zoning ordinance cleanups, if you will. Um, uh, we really wanna let the comprehensive plan update drive bigger policy decisions. Um, the lighting ordinance is the big thing we wanna get done right now, but we will be bringing forward um, some items to be cleaned up and, uh, and we will be bringing you edits our uh, recommendations in, in study sessions in the future. We're really trying to use this spring to get these, um, to get all of this uh, code update work done and have it ready for adoption going into this next summer. So any questions on lighting code and zoning ordinance cleanups? I'm not seeing any, Mr. McNeely, so. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, with that, the last item on your uh, department update is um, just wanting to let you know that um, the county has drafted a county short-term rental ordinance. Um, the county short-term rental ordinance is a standalone ordinance, um, as in it is its own ordinance. It is not integrated to the zoning ordinance, the ordinance that you all typically work with. So it doesn't fall under any purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, but because there had been some, uh, you know, some discussion and activity within the community in getting this ordinance um, drafted, we wanted to give you an update on it. It allows the county to have a, um, have a permit um, uh, or a license, if you will, uh, that short-term rental ordinance, that, sh that short-term rental owners would be required to have. Um, a few uh, key um, requirements for the short-term rentals, um, but uh, none of it really related to land use, as in the land use is still a, um, a residence, typically a single family residence, um, and the county uh, nor any local jurisdiction in the state of Arizona can, um, can regulate or prohibit um, that the short-term rental, as in nightly rental of that residence. So um, that, uh, that draft ordinance is available. We plan to take it to a work session with the Board of Supervisors on January 24th, and we're, we're targeting adoption date on February 28th. Uh, there certainly were people in the community wanting to, wanting to push forward quickly with this ordinance, um, and staff has, has worked to be as responsive as possible. Um, and I see that we have uh, Commissioners Best and Ruggles 
with with um, with questions. So I guess I'll start with with Commissioner Best. What what can I answer? Uh, um, what question you have that we can that we can hopefully give you a good answer on? Well, um, you probably know that we passed a uh, vacation rental ordinance or whatever we would call it. Uh, was it 10 years ago or something? We really put a lot of energy into it and it was uh, valid for about 15 minutes and then the state took away uh, local jurisdictions power to pass such ordinances. Um, have you reviewed that? And I, I know the state has loosened things up just a little bit. I know that there is political pressure in Phoenix to go further, uh, but, but have you reviewed that ordinance that we passed and gotten as much into this ordinance as possible? Um, Commissioner Best, to answer your, your, your question, yes, we have. And I can tell you, and I see that uh, that our Deputy County Attorney Aaron Lumpkin is with us as well, and I'm sure can speak speak on it. And and Jay um, Jay Christman, our director, was very involved from start to finish on this ordinance. Really, um, there was a, a recently um, uh, effective state statute that allowed um, local jurisdictions to have some some regulation and require licensing. And we've pushed the limit of what that legislation allows the county to do. And with that, I'll let Aaron speak since um, he, he can probably answer the question even better. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, Commissioner Best, um, just give a brief FYI, um, touching back on what Mr. McNeely said in regards to this being a standalone ordinance and wanting to give a little bit of background as to why that is. Um, the state legislator, much like they took the power to regulate away from the municipalities and counties a long time ago, have still handicapped us substantially. Um, part of that being that almost any regulation that would generally and intuitively seem to be something that would go into a zoning ordinance um, is brought under an auspice of if a short-term rental um, ordinance is passed that goes into the zoning ordinances, any regulation on a short-term rental has to be generally applicable to all properties, um, certain class properties, which would affect all residential and single family properties. So that's, it kind of limits the scope. If we're wanting to apply something to short-term rentals, it then needs to apply to everyone. So for that reason, we went the route of having a standalone ordinance, which gives us a little bit more freedom um, and leeway in the future to add restrictions as we see fit without running afoul of the zoning ordinance, but couches everything in the rubric of public health and safety. Um, and for those reasons specifically, we couldn't pull too much from the prior ordinance. The statute um, that the legislator passed is fairly prescriptive in what we can do and attempts to play into any of the ambiguities at this point, I feel would have <laughs> invited a substantial risk of litigation. So. We did what we could, and we also played it fairly safe in getting what was in the statute into the ordinance for enforcement purposes. I saw, I, for some reason, I got an email, maybe everybody did from the, somebody at the city about this, and uh, it, it listed what, uh, what we could do, and it sounds like that's what we are doing, uh, just some common sense safety and security things. And... Uh, We'll just have to see. Uh, I know there's pressure from some municipalities, Sedona, for in instance, I think, uh, that are just overwhelmed. And it certainly influences the housing, the, the housing situation. So time will tell. But I guess right now we can only do what we can do. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lumpkin. Thank you, Commissioner Best and Commissioner Ruggles. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Aaron for his uh, rundown on uh, why it's a standalone ordinance. Uh, second thing is, uh, I am uh, I've raised my hand because uh, I've had some emails recently that are just absolute total horror stories about some of what has transpired since uh, um, thirteen fit Senate Bill thirteen fifty was uh, signed into law back in twenty sixteen. Uh, and I think that um, 
The question I had is pretty much the same as that that uh, Commissioner Best had about what is included in our standalone ordinance. And my concern was initially, um, are we including everything that uh, SB 1168 would allow us to do? And apparently the answer is yes. And the reason I want to go forward with my question for just a little bit is uh, I would like to be able to reply to the people who have uh, sent me um, uh, a, a request, uh, essentially a request for help. Um, and I think um, after reviewing SB 1168, um, I think this is far better uh, than what we came up with back in 2016, which like uh, Commissioner Best said, lasted for about 15 minutes um, in terms of being able to uh, tackle some of the problems that have occurred uh, in the uh, years uh, since that. So um, if you can give me some assurance that uh, we have got everything that SB 1168 uh, uh, since it has been signed into law, allows us to do, I would certainly appreciate that. And to answer that question, it's, we have included everything that can be done uh, prescriptively that's expressly stated in the enabling statute. Um, we've included some things that are, that fall into the category of public health and safety. Um, but just due to the ambiguity in the statute, it's in large part a all generally applicable ordinances um, are apply to short term rentals. So it's really referencing that, hey, we already have a lot of the enforcement structure necessary to take care of these issues in place. So anyone that's applying for a short term rental license um, or permit permit in our situation um, is agreeing to abide by um, generally applicable zoning ordinances and laws that we have on our books. Pretty good. Thank you very much. And I, I fully understand what you're uh, telling me. No problem there. Uh, mm -hmm. I will do my best to convey uh, what uh, is in the future for the people who have asked me uh, what the heck is going on here. And by the way, one other thing for the, uh, as a reference for everyone else here on the uh, commission and, and staff, there was an excellent uh, article in the uh, Arizona Republic, I believe it was the 20th of December, that kind of outlined uh, an agreement that the uh, Arizona League of Cities and Towns has reached with the uh, short-term rental business uh, about uh, how they would uh, proceed over the next several years in terms of asking for a complete repeal of uh, SB 1350 from back in 2016. Uh, not everybody uh, in the state has agreed to that, but uh, you might want to take a look at that article um, in light of what we are doing here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Best, is your hand raised or just still raised? No, I'm getting better at it. I actually you. wanted to raise my hand. You uh, are. You are. I just <laughs> didn't know. Go ahead. Since this is kind of informal, uh, let me say that uh, I managed for a family member a vacation rental for three years and never had a problem because uh, I organized it in a way with the help of uh, a company to not have problems. And if hopefully you've talked to the industry, if you haven't talked to the industry, um, I ended up with a particular company. Uh, that did a great job for me. And um, I would be willing to pass that on if you wanted to contact me, um, I, I pass on a contact at that company. Um, it can be done right. Um, and uh, it's in everybody's interest that it be done right. And I don't know what you're allowed to do in detail, but um, certainly a conversation with the industry uh, as Commissioner Ruggles pointed out, uh, they're, they're definitely involved in this. So uh, if you want a contact with somebody that I respect, uh, let me know and I'll pass on the information. Thank you, Commissioner Best. Um, all right, Mr. McNeely, we've got just a few minutes left. 
So let's go ahead and bump to the Board of Supervisors update. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the Board of Supervisors update, we just wanted to let you know that the Dony Park Timberline Fernwood area plan, um, the updated version, was approved on December 13th, and it was approved as a minor amendment to the comprehensive plan. Um, so um, the other thing we wanted to let you know is that uh, the under canvas employee housing zone change and the Munoz zone change um, out in parks are scheduled for public hearing next week on January 11th. Um, not anticipating any issues with either one of those zone change uh, cases, both of recommended uh, for approval by, uh, by this commission. Um, sub 2237, the Ranch at the Peak subdivision, change of conditions of their preliminary plat has been withdrawn. Uh, we kind of ran into some issues um, and did some analysis with, uh, with the attorney's office or really the, the, uh, the county attorney's office did some analysis on this and decided that, that we really needed to um, process this, um, this case differently as a, as a brand new um, preliminary plat as opposed to the way that we had processed it. So that applicant has applied for a new subdivision and, um, and we will be working that one. You, you may very well be seeing that again in the future. Just wanna let you know what happened with that case. Any questions on any of those three? And I know we still have, um, uh, we have the attorney's office with us as well who can help with, um, with the Ranch of the Peaks one. But any questions on the Dony Park Timberline Fernwood um, update or under Canvas, Munoz zone change or the Ranch of the Peaks? As, as um, Dony, of course, DPTF was already approved, the Dony Park Timberline Fernwood area plan was already approved at the board and the rest and these other items. Uh, it, essentially, the zone changes are, are awaiting hearing next week. Okay, Commissioner Bess, go ahead. So does that mean that um, <clears throat> Ranch at the Peak said the money didn't go back to, to the developer? Um, so uh, Commissioner Best, I don't believe that would that would exactly um, suffice what what the what the issues are here or certainly what the um, uh, what staff is dealing with the the developer did bond for improvements so they could get their final plat approved um, final plat approval um, in accordance with our subdivision ordinance um, and and that's still in place um, okay. and, until so until they go back and uh, and get a change of those get those conditions changed the requirement um, change that they bonded for. Um, yeah, that that, uh, um, that issue hasn't, um, no change on the bonding issue so far. Great. Okay. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I see that, um, that uh, Deputy County Attorney Aaron Lumpkin has his hand raised again. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah. It just, yeah, just, um, if this is the last issue in the Board of Supervisors agenda, if I could just take a minute. If not, I, um, yeah, if I could just snag a minute at the end of the session. Sure. That'll, that'll work. All right, so it is 527, um, Commission and Staff Roundtable. Does anyone have any anything? Staff, Council? Well, Andy? I'll step in, <laughs> step in for that, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so yeah, I wanted to announce to the Commission that I will be leaving the county as effective next week. Um, let you all know that I appreciate your service and the time that I've gotten to spend working with you over the past couple of years and let you know that Paul Garns will be remaining to provide legal counsel to the commission. And I believe the current plan is to have Monique Cody, who is our uh, current civil uh, senior deputy, um, stepping in to assist in that role. So this will be uh, my last, sadly, my last planning and zoning commission session with all of you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. This is Chair Tavares. Thank you for, for all the work you've done with us. It's been greatly appreciated and you're going to be missed. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Ruggles. Yes, I, I just had uh, one really brief question. Uh, if um, 
staff and the Board of Supervisors uh, have uh, made any progress in terms of uh, commission appointments? So um, thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. I believe we do have um, one uh, willing uh, local community member who would like to be appointed, um, uh, who's, who's been, in, been in touch with our staff and been in touch with, been in touch with Jay, our director, um, to, uh, to one of the vacancies. Um, so that's the only one that we are seeing on the horizon. Uh, we are hoping to get that person's appointment on the board agenda here probably within the next within the next month. Um, we're fully aware of our other challenges in in open seats um, and uh, and no change except for for one little glimmer of hope. We're hoping to get uh, at least one more person appointed here soon. Yeah, Thank the, you. the reason the reason I. I ask is that uh, um, there are several of us whose appointments are um, have ended or will end soon. Uh, and I personally have a little bit of a problem with just uh, serving without a uh, reappointment um, sure. because of the way the statute is stated. It's a four year term. Uh, I've been in this uh, before. So um, however, uh, I'm perfectly happy to go along with whatever uh, the board and uh, my individual supervisor or any of the other supervisors want to do with this. So that being said, that's enough. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. Um, Commissioner Best, I do see your hand raised, but it is 530. And I'm going to go ahead and call the public hearing to order at this time. So Mr. M <coughs> excuse me. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the meeting rules and procedures. Um, welcome to the January 4th, 2023 meeting of the Coconino County Planning and Zoning Commission. Cases will be heard in the order they appear on the agenda. Following the staff presentation, the applicant and or the applicant's representative may address the commission. As an applicant, if you agree with the staff report and have no additional information, please feel free to keep your comments brief. Any relevant comments are welcome. Following the applicant's presentation, I will make a call to the public. If you wish to address this case, please state your name and address. We ask that your comments be limited to three minutes or less. Comments must be relevant to the case. Please address all comments to the commission. No matter how strongly you may feel about the case, all comments must be polite and courteous. After all interested public have spoken, the public comment portion will be closed. Discussion will then take place amongst commissioners. Decisions of this commission regarding any zone change or preliminary subdivision plat approval are referred to the Board of Supervisors as a recommendation. All other case decisions are binding unless appealed to the Board of Supervisors. If you disagree with the commission's decision, you have 15 days to appeal. Please contact staff at the Community Development Office for appeal procedures. Due to the virtual nature of this meeting, I will be doing a roll call vote of the commissioners to ensure accuracy for the record. Please mute your speakers and turn off your camera. And I also wanna let everyone know that the comment function um, for discussion, it's for communicating with staff only. It is not for giving comments or thoughts or asking questions. And with that, thank you all for joining us this evening and actively participating in our county planning. Um, first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone would please stand, Mr. McNeely, could you please lead us? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will lead everyone through the, uh, through the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, second item on the agenda is the approval of the November 30th, 2022 minutes. If there are no changes or modifications, uh, I'll accept a motion in a second, please.
I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes of November 30th, 2022. I will second, second Commissioner Clifford's motion. Okay, I've got a motion by Commissioner Clifford and a second by Commissioner Ruggles for approval of the November 30th, 2022 minutes. All in favor, please say aye, Commissioner Ruggles. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Vice Chair Burton. Aye. Commissioner Clifford. Aye. Commissioner Best. Aye. Uh, this is Chair Ontiveros. I also vote aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next item is public hearings. And the first hearing under that is case number DRO 22-008. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Jess, Jess McNeely with Community Development Staff. And Bob Short is our principal planner managing this case. I see is he is already sharing his screen. So Bob, if you could please go ahead and give your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jess. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Can everyone hear me okay? Here, great, Bob. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. This case is uh, Aspen Village DRO. It's DRO 22008. And in this case, the property owner is 3450 North Higley LLC, Mesa, Arizona. The applicant is Kevin Kirpan of Kirpan Planning and Design in Chandler, Arizona. The location of the property is on North Fort Valley Road, US Highway 180, uh, just north of Quintana Drive in Flagstaff. The zoning CG 10,000. It's commercial general 10,000 square foot minimum parcel size. And the uh, size of the parcel is actually three parcels, totaling 4.52 acres. The request is a design review for a development with 31 cabins and a general store. The proposal also includes a wildflower meadow, a putting green with artificial turf, a stream, patios, and a dog park. And this is a vicinity map showing the subject parcel. As you can see, this is the city of Flagstaff boundary. This is uh, what I would call a peninsula, a county peninsula into the city. And this uh, parcel almost kind of makes up an entire gap right here. And this is the subject property again. Again, you can see the county, the city boundary around the county. Uh, the reason this parcel has not been annexed into the city is that apparently its boundary along the city line right here is a little bit too short to be annexed in. So that's why they've come to the county. And uh, our county offices, by the way, are right here. So a little background in this case, most of you will remember that this DRO was approved uh, for this site on January 26, 2022, just about a year ago. The only reason the applicant is coming back is because they found a new design for the store on the site, and that new design requires the commission uh, to approve another DRO. So this is a picture showing the site. This is Quintana Drive looking north uh, across the site. This is the site plan. The site plan has not changed much from last year. They did actually move the orientation of the store, the alignment a little bit, kind of straightened it out. Uh, so they did change that. They also are now indicating, as was the requirement of the DRO, that the entire, all the parking area, circulation area is, uh, is now paved. And this is a landscape plan. They indicate they would, they would be using uh, native trees and shrubs. And as you can see throughout the site, uh, I believe it, these are the ones that have uh, dots around them, kind of uh, dash marks. Those are existing trees that would be retained. There are quite a few trees on this site, as you can see in this photo, some very large trees. And of course, you can get a lot of credit for landscaping for saving existing trees. In terms of outdoor lighting, the applicant proposes two different types of fixtures and they, they do meet the lumen count for lighting zone two. Uh, lighting would be fully shielded and narrow specter LED lighting, amber LED lighting. Yeah, 
And these are uh, these are two uh, pictures of the lighting fixtures. This is an elevation of the cabins that they're proposing. They have not proposed to change these. These are the same as before. And this is an elevation showing the original proposed general store on the site. And they are proposing to change that to look like this, more of kind of a Western style. Um, so it it actually does it actually fits a little bit more with the uh, Fort Valley area plan design guidelines, which requires more of a rustic type style. Uh, they have not yet proposed signage for this because they don't know what kind of store will be here. So that is something that the DRO section in the zoning ordinance allows staff to approve. This is a picture of the material that would be used for the siding on all of the development store and the cabins. And this is the split rail fence or an example of a split rail fence they intend to put uh, along the frontage of the property. And this is an example of a wrought iron fence that would go around the dog park they're proposing. And this is uh, the sign and none of these things have changed. As I said, these are all the same. This does look quite dark, but it is actually dark bronze. So it is a brown color. This is, this is a rendering or kind of some um, elevations of the view from Highway 180 or Fort Valley, Drive, Fort Valley Road. And the only thing that would change is that this store right here, it would look like that. So that's the only uh, change. Uh, in terms of public comments, the site was posted and neighbors within 300 feet were notified of the hearing and staff hasn't received any comments on this project. I did actually receive a phone call today, uh, but they had no comments on the design. And uh, for GRO compliance in this, in the uh, Fort Valley design guidelines that requires architectural styles compatible with the rural natural landscape of the planning area, or tone colors of the natural landscape, Roofing materials and colors that blend with the natural environment. Natural materials are high quality natural appearing, synthetic or manufactured materials. Uh, signs that meet the same color requirements of design materials and colors specified in the design guide guidelines and preserving existing vegetation, which they are doing. And in order to approve a design review overlay application, the commission must determine the proposed development is consistent with the design guidelines of the Fort Valley Highway 180 corridor plan design guidelines. They start on page 72 of that plan and they have to, you have to determine that they meet those guidelines to approve a design review application. And with that, uh, staff recommends the commission approve DRO 22008 with conditions in the staff report. And with that, I'll take any questions from the commission. Uh, Commissioner Clifford, go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Short, I was reading in the, be page three of the document. Everything said, Re, uh, goes back to Summit Fire being across the street from the development. From what I know, that fire station across the street is a city-owned fire station, and uh, Summit Fire is down the road on the other side of um, Cheshire. Can you clarify that for me, please? And who will be the fire department that's going to uh, take care of this development? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Clifford, yes, I can clarify that. Sorry about that. I The thing that has happened with uh, Summit Fire and, and the City of Flagstaff Fire Department is they now have a joint administration, but I believe you're correct that they are technically, they are different. And that station is, as far as I can tell, outside the city limits. It's right in that uh, peninsula. But uh, we can, I can check on that and make that change. Either way, that they would be required to have, uh, you know, fire service 
And obviously, if the fire station's right across the street, that would be the fire service that they'd need to obtain. Okay, thank you. All right, any other commissioners with questions for staff? I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to ask if the applicant or the applicant's representative would like to address the commission this evening. And with that, I would also like to ask if the applicant has received uh, the staff report and if they agree with the conditions as written. So if they would like to address, please state your name and address for the record and go ahead. Okay, this is Chair Tavares. I see a Kevin Kirpin who is unmuted, but I can't I can't hear you. Let's see. I'm certainly not a tech person. Um Mr. Short or Mr. McNeely, do you guys have any suggestions? Because it does look like the applicant's trying to talk to us. Okay, now I actually see him. Okay. But, we still, but we still can't hear you. He is unmuted, uh, Madam Chair. I'm not sure what is going on with this. Uh, Vice, Vice Chair Burton, do you have any, any suggestions for the applicant? Uh, just to check which um, microphone source is being used with the application. She just made the application. No, we see, okay, Mr. Kirpin, we see you moving your lips, but we still can't hear you. Sometimes it re it requires closing out the application and, er, and like logging back in. I think he left and uh, we'll be logging back in hopefully. Yeah, yeah, let's, 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 give, let's give it a minute here, yeah. I saw him put his finger up one moment and yeah, and then he was gone. Uh huh. Yeah, I think we're going to see him right back. There he is. Okay. Can we get another deal? Okay, M Mr. Kirpin, go ahead. We do. I do see you unmuted again. But I'm not, I'm not hearing you. Well, perhaps Mr. Kirpin can put something in the chat since I, I'm not sure why we can't hear him. I guess he could indicate that he, you know, agrees with the staff report and conditions in the chat. A visual camera and thumbs up too also works. <laughs> <laughs> he hovers over his volume control. Uh, see if it's on. Um, now, now we see two thumbs up, Mr. Kirpin. Yeah. We see, see you, but on, we don't hear you. If you can see if it's on his computer speaker or if it's on a headphone, you may have to just change his speakers on his volume control. Hmm. Hover over your volume at the bottom right of your computer on minus bottom right. See if you're on headphones or if you're on computer speaker. If you check the, there's the little mic symbol in the lower left, there's a little arrow. If you hover over that, see which microphone is selected, if there's any other options. Okay, so we've got, okay, let's see, we have a chat. 
Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so, and this is, I'm going to read it into the record. This is a response from Kevin Kirpin, the applicant. Um, Mr. Kirpin, just to keep the record straight, go ahead and type in your address, please, and I'll read it for the record. Okay, his address is 4777 South Fulton Ranch Boulevard, Chandler, Arizona. Um, he does indicate again that he is good with the staff reports, <clears throat> excuse me, staff report. So I'm going to ask if there's any, any of the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Kirpin at this time. And um, Okay, I am not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Kirpin. So I am going to ask if there is anyone in the public that wishes to address the commission this evening on this case. If so, please raise your hand or unmute and I will call on you. Okay, and I, I am not seeing any, giving it just a second there. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the, close the public comment portion and open it up at commission discussion. Uh, Commissioner Ruggles, would you please start tonight? Thank you, uh, Chair Ontiveros. Um, I can make the finding required for a modification to the design review as requested. Not a problem with anything that I have uh, seen this evening. So a matter of fact, I, I'd have to say this is a uh, um, for a good change. So that's enough for me. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Ruggles. Uh, Commissioner Williams. Um, yeah, I don't see anything that would concern me. So I'm in favor of it. All right. Uh, Vice Chair Burton. Uh, I don't have any problems with it. Um, <laughs> it it definitely gives it more character. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Clifford. Um, no, there's going to be a great uh, great improvement out there for that uh, that land, and it's going to fit in very well. I can thank you. Uh, make findings. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Clifford. Uh, Commissioner Best. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can also make the findings. I think this is an improvement. Honestly, I wish um, the cabins looked a little less um, modern in their outline, but uh, that opportunity has passed. But I'll just make that comment for staff. Uh, this is a gateway to the community, and my take on it is as you drive down Fort Valley Road, you would want to architecture and colors to match the older buildings. And uh, I, I would have gone a little different direction, but that's okay. That's just a comment. Wow. And uh, I can make the findings and we'll be voting in favor. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Bass. And this is Chair Aunt Tavares. And um, I agree with Commissioner Ruggles' comment that this, that you know, this is somewhat of an improvement. I can definitely support this. So with that, I will accept a motion and a second, please. I'll move that we approve DRO 22-008 as uh, stated in the report. I'll second it. Okay, I've got a motion by Vice Chair Burton and a second by Commissioner Williams to approve DRO 22-008. All, <clears throat> excuse me. All in favor, please say aye. Commissioner Ruggles. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Vice Chair Burton. Aye. Commissioner Clifford. Aye. Commissioner Best. Aye. And this is Chair Tavares, and I also vote aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you, Mr. Kirpin, for trying to join us this evening. Okay, the next item on the agenda is CUP 22-119. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, CUP 22119 is a conditional use permit request for two, uh, two 60 meter met towers and three 100 meter met towers. Those are the meteor, meteorological towers for studying weather. Um, these are going on Babbitt Ranches land. Um, and Bob is managing this case. He already has his screen shared. So go ahead, Bob, and give your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commission. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you, yep. Mr. Short. Okay, thank you. This case is uh, Forge Ethics Met Tower, CEP 22119. Uh, and in this case, the property owners of Babbitt Ranches LLC of Flagstaff, Arizona. The applicant is RWE Renewables Americas LLC of Chicago, Illinois. The representative is Jill Grams of Swicka in Flagstaff. The request is for five temporary meteorological towers and the size um, each tower is proposed on a two acre portion of three parcels and the total amount of land on these three parcels is 26,445 acres, uh, but they use a very small portion of those, of course. This is a vicinity map showing the site. It, as you can see, it is north of Flagstaff and east of Valley off of Highway 180 actually more accessible probably from Highway 89. And this is the site plan showing the site. It, it shows the uh, note that the yellow towers are the 60 meter towers. That's the standard size tower that we have seen before about 200 feet, roughly 200 feet in, in height. Uh, and that does not require lights. The other towers are the 100 meter towers in blue. There are three of those. And uh, they do require, require lights because they are over 200 feet. And we'll talk about that more in a second. If I can advance my screen, that is, there it goes. All right, this is a photograph of, of, of Babbitt Ranches. This is looking out across this wide expanse of Babbitt Ranches where the uh, towers would be located. And this is a picture of a previously approved tower nearby here, the, this area. This is a typical roughly 200 foot tower, 60 meter tower. Uh, now, the, 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 the biggest issue with this is basically aircraft detection lighting system. So like I said before, there are 300 meter towers. That's uh, roughly 328 feet, if I did the math correctly. Uh, and those at that height, they do require a light on the top by the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. So if you look at our zoning ordinance, uh, it specifically requires that ADLS systems be used for cell towers and also in the new Rio, the Renewable Energy Ordinance, it requires that permanent MET towers in uh, renewable energy projects be required to have lights on the top. So that is something that we consider. It's similar to an issue we had recently where in many parts of our zoning ordinance, it requires that sound levels be limited to 50 decibels at property lines. So sometimes that flows over into other things that aren't specifically required to do that. Like in this case, uh, staff looked at this and actually the applicant made the argument and staff agreed with it that uh, while this is a, pre a, a precursor to a renewable energy project, we expect uh, a wind farm to be developed in this area, it is not actually part of that renewable energy project. So, um, and the applicant has requested that the ADLS system not be required and they've, um, they've given several reasons for that. The first one is that they are impractical for temporary towers, especially in this case where they are all separate, they're separated by, by miles each. And each one requires a particular 
ADLS tower be installed and it just doesn't really, it just, it's not practical, it's not viable uh, for temporary towers such as this. Uh, also the taller MET towers, the reason they need to use these to install these taller MET towers is so they can get higher up and collect data about the wind at higher and higher, greater heights. And this is so they can determine what size wind turbines they will eventually need out here. So what it allows them to do is when they collect that data, they can determine if if taller uh, wind generators are going to work better. And it can also reduce the number of wind generators they need because they're higher up and they and they get uh, and they can pull in more energy that way. Unfortunately, they're also taller. So when you have taller wind generators, of course, they're more visible. Uh, these MET towers would also be removed in three years. So there's a clear condition in the staff report that indicates they won't stay up longer than three years. At that point, we expect that we'll get a, a uh, application for a wind farm here and that the applicant will be installing permanent MET towers and those permanent MET towers would be required to be hooked up to an ADLS system. And the last thing, the last uh, is that the lights on the MET towers would be minimally visible uh, from Highway 89. I believe it's about 10 miles. The applicant says in their narrative that you can about 10 miles is the range. That's about how far away you could see a, a MET tower at this height with a light on the top of it. So you might be able to see it if you're driving along 89 and look real carefully. Um, that it, It's kind of difficult to tell at this point, but it would probably not something that would stand out if you could actually see it. There's also a lot of topography involved with this. So the topography could, be, could block it as well. And I'll go back to the site plan here just to show you. So if you look at the blue Met Towers, this one is approximately 10 miles to Highway 89. This one's farther. And then this one is relatively close. It's about, I think it's about five miles to Highway 180. Uh, the topography in here, there's quite a bit of topography in this area. So that could also make it less visible. In any case, uh, they are kind of spread out. They are, and they should be uh, minimally visible in this area. They also looked at the North Rim. The North Rim is approximately, it's higher up, but it's about 32 miles away. So the applicant is indicating they don't expect it to be visible from there. So in terms of citizen participation, since these Met towers are generally, and this one is in a very remote location. We don't require a neighborhood meeting, uh, but in this case, we did require that they contact the National Forest Service, or excuse me, the Coconino National Forest, the Kaibab National Forest, the Arizona State Land Department, Arizona Game and Fish Department, the Arizona Trail Association, since the Arizona Trail does move through this area, and the Navajo Nation. Uh, staff hasn't received any comments on this application. This is a staff analysis. As you know, MET Tower is an allowed use in the general zone with approval of a conditional use permit. This is an isolated area, not visible from highways, at least um, and during the daytime. Uh, towers over 200 feet should have minimal impacts and the application is consistent with the policies of the comprehensive plan as I have uh, discussed in the staff report. These are the findings for a conditional use permit. Those have been discussed in the staff report. And with that, staff recommends approval of CV 22119 with the recommended conditions. And I'll take any questions from the commission. Okay, Mr. Short, I am not seeing any, so I'm going to ask if the applicant or the applicant's representative would like to address the commission. And I would also like to ask the applicant if they have uh, received the staff report and if they agree with the conditions. Uh, so if you would please state your name and address for the record and go ahead and address the commission. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, my name, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Michael Savori. I'm a director of development at RWE Renewables. My address is 3400 Harmon Avenue, Austin, Texas, 78705. We have had a chance to review the, uh, the staff report. We agree to the stipulations that have, set, have been set forth and uh, appreciate the opportunity to continue to work with uh, Coconino County in furtherance of, of building a wind farm. I'm open to any questions if you have any. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Savor. Do any of the commissioners have questions for the applicant? I'm not seeing any, so I'm gonna go ahead, <coughs> excuse me, and open it to the public. Does anyone in the public wish to address the commission on this case this evening? If so, please raise your hand or unmute and I'll call on you. Okay, I am not seeing any. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close it to the public and open it at commission discussion. Commissioner Ruggles. Thank you. Uh... Here on Tavares. Sorry, uh, my uh, microphone took a trip off the table here, but uh, I'm back. Anyway, uh, I do have to say that uh, uh, one, I can I can make the findings uh, for this uh, CUP. Second thing, I, I will comment on the uh, staff recommendations and the applicant's request. Uh, about the uh, ADLS system. Um, I could uh, not agree more with the assessment that uh, staff has made, uh, nor could I agree more with the, uh, the applicant's request on this. Uh, I realize what the, um, the problems would be with using a system like that in a location like this. I'm familiar with the uh, location. Um, it, it would be an unnecessary burden on the applicant to require an ADLS system or temporary MET towers, especially in this location. I understand the engineering problems and the problems of practicality with this. So that being said, <clears throat> I can make the findings for this and uh, not much more I have to say about it. Thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. Uh, Commissioner Williams. I can make the findings too. Um, and I agree with Commissioner Ruggles' thoughts. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Burton. I can also make the findings. Okay, Commissioner Clifford. I can make the findings. Thank you, and Commissioner Best. I can make the findings and I'm encouraged to see the re renewable energy project going in or hopefully going in. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Bess. And this is Chair Tavares, and I also can make the findings uh, for approval for these MET towers. So, uh, and I will also say that I, I very much concur with Commissioner Ruggles' comments um, on the engineering and the, the applicant's request. Um, excuse me, on the uh, the lighting. So with that, can we please move to a motion in the second, please? Right, move that we approve CUP-22-119. I'll second that. Okay, I've got a motion by Vice Chair Burton and a second by Commissioner Clifford for approval of CUP-22-119. All in favor, please say aye. Commissioner Ruggles. Aye. Commissioner Williams? Aye. Vice Chair Burton? Aye. Commissioner Clifford? Aye. Commissioner Best? Aye. This is Chair Ontiveros, and I also vote aye. The motion passes unanimously. And the final item on the agenda tonight is for a call to the public for items not on the agenda. Is there anyone that wishes to address this uh, commission this evening for items not on the agenda? And I'm not seeing any, so it is 6.08 p.m. and I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And Aaron, did you want to talk to the commission anymore or did you, was, was your goodbye what you wanted to say? 
<laughs> uh, the goodbye was what I had intended to say. Uh, there's okay, nothing more and for I, me. Okay, and I figured it was, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity. And again, Aaron, my very best to you as you move forward in your new in your new venture. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Take care, Aaron, and happy new year. Happy new year. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for your support, Aaron. Yeah. Happy new year, everybody, and I'll see you at the end of the month. Okay, happy night. new year. Okay, good happy night. New year. Happy new year, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night.